It's a joy to be with you, but what a week as we come to worship. There must be all sorts of things going through our minds and to say I've struggled this week <clears throat> would be to put it mildly, but that's my responsibility as we come here to worship, to lead you in worship, and I trust that God will have something to say to each one of us this morning. <clears throat> I want to take some words from Psalm 121. Blessed are all... Sorry. That's not it. <laughs> I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will neither slumber nor sleep. Indeed, the Lord watches over Israel. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forever. We have some very close friends Steve and Chris. Chris was born in Israel. Her father was a pastor in Jerusalem for many years. And they have many friends and contacts in Israel. And uh, on Monday we texted them offering our prayers and support for this coming week in view of what had happened the previous weekend and Steve wrote back and quoted from that psalm trusting that the Lord was indeed watching over Israel. It's a psalm we often read <coughs> but when you know of folk who are in touch with those who are suffering then it perhaps takes on a different meaning and you might feel it strange, the readings that we're going to have this morning, but I've been thinking of a storm and a battle. And that will be reflected right throughout our worship this morning. <clears throat> you might think that that is a hymn that we might more often say for Sea Sunday, which normally takes place in July. But... Uh, Monday morning, uh, part of my readings uh, every day is to go through the Psalms. And uh, on Monday, uh, the, the reading was out of Psalm 107. And it picks up this theme, and it was as if God was saying to me, this is the theme for this week. So let's just read those few verses from Psalm 107. We start at verse 23. Others went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. <coughs> he stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. Now I know the context is not the same, but here were people in deep distress literally at their wit's end, 
knowing not not knowing what to do and as if God was speaking to me because that's how the world felt at the beginning of the week and still continues to feel. So I felt that that would be a reflection of where we would start this morning. And this was the reflection out of that psalm. It's headed the storm battered. Here are people threatened by forces far beyond them. Sea travel can be a metaphor for life. There are clear days in which we feel we are in control, that our sea craft can take us anywhere we want to go. But when great storms come up, we realise we are helpless before the enormity of the waves. The illusion is shattered that life, or the sea, can be tamed through our management skills wits. Life troubles will sink us if we are on our own. But God is our haven in storms. And the New Testament reminds us that he helps us in two ways. Either by removing the storm, as he did in the account in Mark's Gospel, or by enabling us to walk through it as he demonstrated with Peter in the Gospel of Matthew. And so it's on that reflection that I want us to come into God's presence this morning. Let's just pray together. Father God, as we come to you in worship, Lord, our hearts and our minds perhaps are in turmoil. We wonder what a day may bring. We wonder what more troubles might come. And Lord, as many a person has reminded us that when we look at the events of the world, we should certainly look at what goes on in the Middle East, in Jerusalem. And Lord, we will want to claim your desire for us to pray this morning, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and Israel and the Middle East. Lord, we cry out to you this morning. And as we shall move through your word, Lord, we pray that our hearts might be stilled and we might be encouraged and strengthened because we ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Acts 26, and then moving on to 27, uh, up, I'm up to uh, verse 12. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Paul sails for Rome. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Adramidium, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so that they might prevail, provide for his needs. From there we put out to sea again and passed to the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Mycenae. There the, there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving off Canidus. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the lee of Crete, opposite Salmony. 
we moved along the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lacia. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Since the harbour was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbour in Crete, facing both southwest and northwest. The Star. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity. <coughs> so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force, called the Northeaster, swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Carda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Surtis, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you, to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. <coughs> you must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. The Shipwreck On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. And about midnight the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took surroundings and found that the water was 40 metres deep. A short time later they took soundings again and found it was 30 metres deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the, from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay with the ship, we cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, You have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. 
Then he broke it and began to eat. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing grain into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognise the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the, fo hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on the other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. Amen. What a story. What a story. And it's good just to hear it read completely. But sometimes we don't always take time to do just that. When peace like a river, let's put just that slide up, battling the storms of life. <coughs> because that's what this particular account uh, enables us to reflect upon. We put this in the context of where we are, whether it's as individuals, as a nation, or even as a world today. Horatio Stafford was born, or rather the hymn, was born out of tragedy and the inspirational faith of Horatio. When peace like a river attendeth my way. It's a hymn that stood the test of time. The story behind the verses still carries a statement of faith for many facing grief, loss and tragedy. And almost reads like a retelling of the book of Job. In 1870, Horatio Stafford was a successful Chicago lawyer with every reason to be thankful to God. A supporter of preachers like Dwight Moody and uh, Ira Sankey, prominent Christian evangelists of the time, they all formed a circle of his friends. In 1871, his four-year-old son died. While struggling with this personal tragedy, <coughs> the great Chicago fire of the same year reduced his family property investments and financial security to ashes. What remained was seriously developed devalued in the financial downturn that followed. Here is a man going through desperate personal loss and financial instability. The phrase, when sorrows like sea billows roll. To give the family time and space to recover, Horatio made plans for him, his wife and his four daughters to join and encourage Moody and Sankey on one of their European preaching tours. Boarding the SS Ville de Havre in November 1873, a business emergency forced Horatio to remain in Chicago while the family went on ahead. In mid-Atlantic, that a half had collided with another ship, the Loch Erm, and sunk in 12 minutes with the loss of 226 of the 307 passengers and crew. Several days later, Horatio received a telegram from his wife, Anna. 
He was in Wales. Just two words. Saved a lamp. All four of their daughters, Annie, Maggie, Bessie and baby Tanetta, who was torn from her mother's arms by the first of the water, were lost. The line from the hymn, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. Horatio immediately set off for Wales to bring his wife home. On the crossing to Wales, the ship's captain summoned Horatio to the bridge, informing him that a careful reckoning has been made, and I believe we are now passing the place where the Vildahav was wrecked. Horatio returned to his cabin, and that night wrote the words which became the hymn that we've just sung. It is well with my soul. To which Arthur Bliss later added the familiar melody. In her grief and despair, other survivors feared that Anna might take her own life. Later she spoke of hearing a voice saying, you are saved for a purpose. And remember that a friend had once said, it's easy to be grateful and good when you have so much. But take care that you're not a fair weather friend of God. Horatio and Hannah, or Anna rather, returned to Chicago in 1876, they had another son who they called Horatio. And in 1878, a daughter, Bertha. Horatio died from scarlet fever, aged only four. In 1880, they had another daughter, who they named Grace. Must have taken a lot to do that. To name your newly born daughter Grace, having suffered the tragedies in the family. Even so, he wrote in his hymn, even so, it is well with my soul. The following year, the Spaffords and a few of their friends left America for Israel, settling in the old part of Jerusalem. Seeing the needy, the poor, the sick, the homeless, their work became known as the American Colony. In fact, it was the subject of a Nobel Prize winning novel called Jerusalem by a Swedish author by the name of Selma Lagerlof. The place became a training centre for nurses. The Anna Spafford Baby Home, an orphanage and a school of handicrafts. <clears throat> this has now since developed into a place called the Spafford's <coughs> Children's Centre, working to support needy Palestinian children. Perhaps you could see why I felt that God was leading me in this direction during the days of this week. A story that goes back to the 1880s, ends up in Jerusalem, <coughs> ends up where even now they're seeking to help Palestinian children. You know, God moves in mysterious ways, we often see. 
God moves in mysterious ways, <coughs> his wonders to perform. But where does that fit in to the storm that we've just read about? Well, in a number of different ways. You know, the folk on board the ship, the centurion, the crew, and being in touch with the owner, they didn't listen to what Paul said when he gave a very prophetic word about what would happen. I mean, the time of the year was, was this time of the year. The Jews have just celebrated their feast. A bad time for sailing. You've only got to think of the Mediterranean and, and the number of uh, folk who are seeking to get from North Africa across to, was it Lampedusa? And then on into Italy. And the number of ships that are lost in that particular area. And it's a graveyard of ships. <laughs> it was then in Paul's day and it continues to be. History has a habit of repeating itself, doesn't it? But all this is tied up with the issues that are going on in our world at this time. And so often we're listening to the long, wrong voices. We're making the wrong choices. There's another thread in that particular passage. You notice that the root took them up under Cyprus and they landed at a place called Fair Havens where they could have spent the winter. Sounds a suitable name although it more, sounds more like a, somebody putting on their bungalow. But it, it wasn't a very big place. They wanted to go on to the end of the island to Phoenix, which was a much better place if you were going to winter and, and, and you had a crowd of seamen. But they weren't listening to Paul's voice. And God was speaking through Paul. They were making the wrong choices. And every choice they made caused them further disaster. Because they listened to the owner of the ship who wanted to get his cargo to Italy. They had to ditch the cargo and then they started to ditch other elements on board ship. You know, that so often happens when the wrong choices are made. As I was thinking of this, my mind went back to the time when I was on sabbatical in South Africa and uh, I was speaking or due to speak at a, a Bible college. And when I got to the Bible college I was told about a, a young lady who they were caring for in the college. Marilyn was a former high priestess in a witch's coven in Cape Town. She'd been abused from the age of three and led into all forms of addiction. Although brought to faith in Jesus and gradually delivered from drug addiction, she was constantly being threatened by her former gang <coughs> members. That week, the week I was there, She'd been attacked and forcibly injected with drugs. And the Bible College had taken in, her in to try and care for her and bring her back to health. Wrong choices. Listening to the wrong voices. You know, Paul was only on board that ship because of a decision, a choice that he had made. As we saw at the end of chapter 26, that 
if he had not appealed to Caesar, the people who were trying him, King Agrippa, Festus, was it Festus or was it Felix? I'm not sure. Get them mixed up sometimes. But he could have been set free. But see, the purposes of God, God wanted him in Rome. And the choices he made were that. Not just for his own convenience. You know, I often think of the choices I make the basis on which I make them. Is it convenience? Or is it because I'm listening to the voice of God? Put up another slide, shall we, John? A verse out of the Old Testament, out of the prophet Isaiah. I'm quite sure when we hear those words from Paul on board ship, I heard a voice. I'm sure somebody who would well know the scriptures, his mind would have gone back to that. Do not be afraid. The voice of God to Paul on board. Don't be afraid, Paul. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. For I am the Lord your God your saviour. When we know the scriptures, when we hear God speaking, perhaps he's spoken to us in the past, we've held on to that word. That's why I'm important, John, please. <coughs> Anchors. Very quickly, this reflection. Anchors that hold in the midst of the storms of life. You know, in verse 20 it said, it says, fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. Let's look at the first anchor. Hope is found in the strong anchor of God's presence. Men, last night an angel of the God, whose I am and whom I serve. Is that me? Is that you? We know God through Christ. He stands with us. In these difficult days, don't be afraid. The anchor of God's presence. You sense his presence when times are difficult. That's what this account is encouraging us to enter into. The second one. Found in the anchor of God's purposes. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. I wonder how much the progress of the gospel would have been changed if Paul had not followed the message that he'd received. If he'd taken the easier way out. He was there to strengthen the believers in Rome. He was there to have an opportunity to be confronting the leader of the Roman world but he could have avoided it. But God had a purpose. God has a purpose for you and me. God had a purpose for Anna Spafford, despite the tragedy, despite what was going on in their lives, despite the fact that her friends felt that she might commit suicide. I have a purpose for you. God has a purpose for each and every one of us. The third anchor. Hope is found in the strong anchor of God's power. 
So keep your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nobody was lost. Nobody will be lost. Nobody was lost. The ship was gone. They'd lost everything. Cargo. But the lives were saved. God's purpose. God's power. The four anchors of God. The last flyer. Come out of order. Sorry, no. <coughs> yeah, I think we've got I think one. I think I skipped one. <laughs> Not to worry. Not, they're all in there. Four anchors. The promises, the power. And when you get to my age, you can't remember four things in one go. <laughs> the purpose, the presence. You know, in these difficult days, we're not, we're not where they are in Israel or Gaza, but we have our own struggles and our own battles. And if we can't cope with the smaller, minor battles, how will God take us on to harder things? It might be with our health. It might be with our finances. It might be with our work. But oh how I would want to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Those four daughters that Horatio and Anna lost in the Atlantic had just previously been to some of the meetings of uh, Sankey and Moody. And each one of those girls had committed their lives to Jesus Christ. So it wasn't only well for the parents. Well, it was, it, was, it was well because they knew that their family had responded to Christ. I'm sure we all have folk within our families, among our friends, who don't know Jesus. And we long that they might. Let's hold on to the anchors. And we'll put that final slide up, John. Hope in God. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, as we move into communion. Is that the hope of our hearts? Is that a message that God brings to us today? anchor of our soul. We know him. Our life and our future is based on his promises, his purposes, his power. Just a moment of prayer before we sit. Father God, we thank and praise you that you are with us in the battles of life. And they do seem like a sea voyage. Help us as we reflect on that in these coming days. To be given the faith and the trust to honour you and to see your purposes being worked out. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's very interesting. Um, the word for today, I don't know whether any of you take it at all, but the word for today, uh, today's reading was, we know that in all things God works together for good to those who love him. I thank God for those readings that I've had this week, on Monday and today, that blend together to help me trust God. 